Before we get started on this video, I want to give you a quick language warning. The research that I'm going to be quoting does contain swearing. Unfortunately, this is just part of the defining terms that they've used in their research, but I will be shortening the swear word to BS. Welcome back to my channel, my name is Louisa. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe, and if you're coming back, welcome back. So today's video is all about psychology research that I have stumbled across, which <laughs> literally is all about New Age BS. Psychology researchers have developed a measuring tool known as the BS Receptivity Scale. And what this does is it measures how susceptible people are to believing what's called pseudo-profound BS. <laughs> the researchers based a lot of their ideas for these sort of buzzwords and new age uh, empty, pseudo-profound statements from the work of Deepak Chopra. They took a lot of his uh, tweets and developed this um, computerized algorithm which randomly generates syntactically correct statements. So their sentences, they are grammatically correct, but they don't really have any meaning. They just have a lot of profound sounding buzzwords in them and so they generated these uh, buzzword statements and then presented them to people alongside historically profound statements that a lot of people are familiar with. And then they got the research participants to rate the different statements in terms of profundity whether they believe these statements to be profound or not, and how profound they rated them overall. On the left here, you can see the website that they built, which does a whole bunch of bot writing <laughs> with New Age buzzwords. And all you do is press the button at the top, which says re-ionize electrons, and it will randomly generate these um, catchphrases, which sound really uh, interesting but don't really say anything at all and if you compare them to Deepak Chopra's tweets over on the right I think that the bot actually makes more sense than Deepak does uh, which is not good. So in a minute we're going to get into the research and what it is that they found about the mindset of people who really believe this stuff and also the mindset of the people who kind of create this stuff because that's very interesting. But in today's video I'm also going to give you a personal story about actually working for a new age wellness center. In 2018 I found myself being divorced and so I decided to go on a bit of a journey. I had been working in government for a decade and I had long service leave. I had like three months worth of leave. So I cashed in my leave. I went traveling independently and I had my dog with me. And I had a few odd jobs here and there. So some of them were in hospitality and some of them were like farmhand work. But one of the jobs was in a new age wellness center with a husband and wife uh, team who believed that they were energy healers. For the sake of privacy, I'm not going to name names or specify 
what the business name is. But this is what they say about themselves currently on their website and these are their current prices as of uh, August 2022. So they do claim to be energy healers and they do claim to provide spiritual healing and it's very difficult to really prove that or even disprove that. So I worked in this job for probably about three months and there were like when I took the job it said that it was four days a week and then when I actually started the job it turned into five days, six days, uh, sometimes seven days a week and so I was expected to put in at least as many hours as the business owners. And there was one time I had to refuse to work on a day which was supposed to be my day off because I needed to do laundry <laughs> and I needed to get my hair cut and I was like it's up to you if you want someone who essentially looks like a homeless person to front your business. The cutoff point for me was when they decided to pimp me out to their relatives uh, and essentially use my labor and my services for other people's businesses and they didn't tell me that I wasn't going to be paid for that they didn't tell me that I had to chase up payment from their relatives for the work that I had done I found that out afterwards so they very much exploited their employees they didn't have a lot of employees most of them were family <laughs> their own children and um yeah I, I, even their children were like yeah we're being exploited and we know that but they did it anyway because you know you want to make your parents happy i guess they also charged really exorbitant prices and to the point where I was a little bit uncomfortable with that, like charging people $250 an hour is a lot of money, <laughs> especially for a service that doesn't really have like a tangible outcome necessarily. You can't always put your finger on whether it's worked or not. Part of their business was kind of legitimate, like they sold health supplements and they tested people for like food intolerances and looked at their medical history. The husband actually had a degree in nursing and he had experience working as a registered nurse. So he kind of brought uh, an element of legitimacy to their practice and they also had people who kind of contracted for the business who were like remedial massage people um, and they worked within the business but they sort of worked for themselves and the business took a cut of their fee uh, to sort of do the bookings and the administration and that sort of thing. So those people had legitimate services that they offered like remedial massage or dietary advice and it wasn't necessarily bad dietary advice or bad advice on supplements it did seem to really genuinely help people so there was a legitimate side to the business and then there was like the sort of squiffy energy healing side to the business which was hard to pin down and hard to really validate and you find this a lot in the new age and in sort of snake oil salespeople is that they they have part of their business which is based on truth and based on real evidence and based on real practices and then they usually have something that is a bit out there and hard to qualify and probably BS but often that's the side of the business that makes a whole lot of money <laughs> so the energy healing part of things and the retreats and stuff that they ran 
they were sort of pseudo psychology, pseudo science, and pseudo spirituality, pseudo profound kinds of uh, advice and exercises and things like that. And so part of it was based on pop psychology, but it was often um, exaggerated claims of healing and things like that. One of the things that made me incredibly uncomfortable working for them was that people would come in for these energy healing sessions and they would talk about deeply personal things, traumatic things. Um, they were essentially coming for counseling in many respects, but the woman who did the energy healing, she would come out after her client had left and she would tell me all sorts of things that the client had revealed to her about their personal life, which I was not supposed to know. Like, if you're a counsellor, you don't go out to the reception person and blab about your client as soon as they've gone. That is seriously crossing an ethical boundary, which should exist no matter what kind of practice you are running. So that made me uncomfortable. But the thing is, like, I couldn't even really say anything to her because she was literally my boss. And the other thing that she told me about when she did her energy healing is that she was trying to prompt people to remember things that they couldn't remember. So she was getting them to, uh, I guess, uncover suppressed memories. Now, I am a psychology student. I'm in my third year of the undergraduate. And this has come up a number of times during my course, the, uh, the issue of memory, which comes under the branch of cognitive psychology and the study of memory and whether people can repress memories, whether people can recover memories and whether memories can be implanted. Someone in the new age who is renowned for attempting to work with recovered memories is Teal Swan. And I have been looking into her work lately because she was someone that I never really warmed to when I was in the new age. She always seemed like a really cold kind of person. But one of the things that Teal claims will help people heal their trauma is if they recover suppressed memories. So these are essentially memories that they don't remember. And the thing about cognitive psychology is that memory is not as stable as you might think. This is actually a good thing because if you could remember everything about your life, and there are people who can, and I actually used to work in a library in Queensland where one of our customers who has appeared on 60 Minutes Australia, she could remember every aspect of her life. Um, she had sequential photographic memory and it could be very distressing for her because she couldn't forget things. She couldn't allow memories to fade with time. And so there were things that she could remember that were embarrassing and traumatic and really difficult. And she couldn't enjoy the sorts of benefits that most of us have with our memory where it becomes muted over time, it fades with time. We reframe it in ways that help us to deal with it emotionally. So memory is not supposed to be 100% all the time because if it was we would have to live with the most embarrassing <laughs> memories of our past and the most horrific memories of our past. And part of the therapy of post-traumatic stress is to actually bring memories up and then talk through them, reduce the emotional attachment to them and then restore 
those memories in the memory bank in a less volatile way. So psychology does know that memory can be suppressed. Memory can certainly be uh, blanked out in, in many respects. And it's often protective to not remember things in their entirety. And trauma victims will often have gaps in their memory and holes. But the thing is, they're aware that that gap is there. It's not like, oh, I never knew that I had a gap in my memory. Gosh, how can I possibly recover it? I must get someone to help me recover this memory that I didn't know that I lost. No, trauma victims are perfectly well aware that they have gaps in their memory and that those gaps are suppressed for a reason. Something else that psychology does know through repeated research is that memories can be implanted. And there have actually been counsellors who were successfully sued and banned from practising because they implanted memories in their clients and it was unethical. If a counsellor goes in with an agenda to prompt someone to remember something that they don't remember that possibly never happened, then that is incredibly unethical and potentially really damaging. It's damaging not just to the client, but also to all of their family and friends who might be implicated in whatever these memories happen to take the form of once they have been implanted. So real psychologists and real counsellors don't coach their clients in recovering memories. They don't suggest things. They simply allow the clients to talk. And if things come up, they explore them with the client, but the client leads the discussion. Psychology researchers have successfully implanted memories in people through hypnosis and through suggestion. And this is why police officers aren't allowed to lead the witnesses because one of the problems with being an authority figure, so if you're a counsellor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a police officer, you are in a position of authority over the person who you are interviewing or counselling. And they are more likely to believe you if you suggest that something might be true. So people in positions of authority are not supposed to abuse that position of authority. And that's why New Age gurus like Teal Swan, who say that they are on an agenda to recover memories in people, that's extremely dangerous. So yeah, even though I was in the New Age at the time, I was probably more like uh, a pagan than a New Ager, <laughs> to be honest. But working for that business, I saw a lot of really dirty practices that I could not condone and which made me extremely uncomfortable. And so I only stayed there for a few months and then I quit. So now I'm going to show you some of the research that has been done into pseudo profound BS in the new age. It was actually really difficult to decide where to start with unraveling all of the claims that people make in the new age. So I thought I would start with possibly the most credible claim that is on this particular page which is a master NLP coach. What is NLP and does it have any basis in psychology or science or objective research? The impression that people get from the word master is a certain level of study or proficiency in a particular field. But where do they get this accreditation from? Where do they do this study? Who accredits it? And what are the measuring sticks that they use to decide if someone is indeed a master NLP coach? Gareth Roderick Davies from the University of Glamorgan, who is a psychologist 
and a lecturer in cognitive psychology and experimental design and analysis, he wrote a peer-reviewed journal on neurolinguistic programming, what the history of NLP is and how people become accredited. He writes, Neurolinguistic programming is a school of thought founded on the psychotherapeutic ideas of Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Since the publication of their co-authored book, The Structure of Magic, in 1975, in which Bandler and Grinder describe NLP as therapeutic magic, NLP has developed into a worldwide phenomenon. A simple Google UK search reveals a plethora of organisations and individuals offering NLP for training, personal development, coaching, and as an intervention aid for eating disorders, addictions, dyslexia, depression, and chronic fatigue syndrome, to name but a few, NLP has been described by Tosi and Matheson as one of the world's most popular forms of interpersonal skill and communication training, and is a recognized form of psychotherapy according to the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy. To the casual observer, NLP appears to be a widely accepted set of techniques. Indeed, NLP has found its way into a number of academic institutions, appearing in peer-reviewed journals from an array of disciplines including counselling, business, marketing and education. This gives the impression that it is not only widely used but is academically credible, with a sound research base to support it. In short, NLP presents as a technique that we should all be aware of. It presents as though its central ideas should be universally available since it represents a model of human behaviour that can dramatically improve communication skills, empathy, and indeed troublesome thought processes. Despite the cloak of respectability, the truth about NLP borders on the worrying. This paper argues that NLP is an ill-defined chameleon that masquerades as a discipline open to the rigours of academic inquiry, when in fact there is spectacularly no evidence to support NLP. So what is NLP? The term neurolinguistic programming conjures up an air of scientific respectability, yet its very name is wholly inappropriate. O'Connor and Seymour explain why this particular nomenclature was used. Neuro refers to our neurology, or our thinking patterns. Linguistic is language, how we use it and how we are influenced by it. And programming refers to the patterns of our behaviour and the goals we set. Bandler is reported to have stated that neurolinguistic processing was a term that he made up to avoid having to be specialised in one field. This would constitute a forgivable admission were it not for the persistence of its use today, and the pseudoscientific yet totally misleading connotations of the term. Firstly, our thinking patterns should be defined as cognition, not neuro. Use of the latter word is effectively fraudulent since NLP offers no explanation at a neuronal level, and it could be argued that its use fallaciously feeds into the notion of scientific credibility. Linguistic again makes associations with the academically credible field of linguistics, and how does programming equate to the patterns of our behaviour and the goals we set? Aren't these behaviours and thought processes? Indeed, programming actually implies a lack of conscious thought processes. The links with scientific credibility persist in NLP books. For example, NLP is the art and science of excellence. Yet despite this, and despite its very name suggesting strong links with acceptable science, NLP has no credible basis in neuroscience and has been largely disowned by the very academic fields within which it claims to lie, namely psychology and linguistics. What are NLP's central ideas? NLP was founded on central philosophies born out of Bandler and Grinder's observations of transcripts and films of psychotherapy sessions. In particular, Bandler and Grinder were influenced by the hypnotherapist Milton Erickson, the family therapist Virginia Sater, and the founder of Gestalt Therapy, Fritz Perls. They considered these therapists to have a reputation for success and sensibly wanted to attempt to learn from their techniques. However, as Heap points out, what resulted was not a set of techniques based on good practice, but rather a number of suggestions of the ways in which we behave, think, and communicate. A core principle proposed in NLP is the notion of a preferred representational system, or PRS. 
It is suggested that individuals construct internal maps of the world by processing external information through five sensory systems, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. It should be noted that in the context of NLP, kinesthetic inexplicably refers to feelings in general. It is suggested within NLP that a person's conscious activity predominantly uses one of these systems, particularly visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And according to Grinder and Bandler, the particular system being used at any given time is reflected in that individual's style of speaking. An individual thinking in the visual mode, for example, will tend to predicate sentences with visually related words such as I can see that or it looks to me as if. Bandler and Grinder also claimed that the representational system an individual uses at any given time can be revealed in their eye movements. For example, it is proposed that the kinesthetic mode is associated with a downward gaze to the right. Given that Grinder and Bandler propose that each individual has a preferred idiosyncratic representational system, it follows that two individuals perceiving the world through different systems will be having different experiences of that world. In order to achieve maximally effective communication, NLP proposes the notion of matching, whereby one individual matching the verbal and nonverbal behaviors of another individual can tune into their representational system and hence to their view of the world. So what is the evidence for NLP's central ideas? If the claims of Bandler and Grinder were substantiated, then it would be true to say that they had uncovered a cornerstone of human cognition. They are claims that easily lend themselves to empirical investigation, and in the 30 years since the claims were first made, volumes of supportive research evidence should be available to underpin these theories being taught in university psychology departments across the world. Three decades on, however, the most striking observation about the perpetuation of NLP is that it exists almost entirely in isolation from published evidence to substantiate it. The core ideas of NLP from the mid-1970s were mostly discredited in the 1980s. Sharply reviewed the research to date concerning NLP's assertion of a PRS and concluded that there was little evidence for the use of a PRS in NLP, with much data to the contrary. Even prior to NLP, mainstream psychology had been investigating the link between hemispheric asymmetry, reviewed by Ehrlichman and Weinberger, and eye movements, so it was not unreasonable for Bandler and Grinder to propose a link. However, in terms of the specific claims made by NLP, the supportive evidence is scant and at best offers only partial support. Wertheim Aol, for example, examined the hypothesis that eye movements reflect sensory processing. Consistent with Bandler and Grinder's claims, Wertheim and co-workers found evidence of increased upward eye positioning and stares when participants were asked to recall visual information, but findings from the auditory and kinesthetic modalities were inconsistent. Further, Wertheim and colleagues dismissed any notion of their findings being supportive of NLP since auditory type eye position changes were most prevalent in all three stimulus conditions. Beyond this one study, evidence from Bandler and Grinder's claims is notable by its absence from the cognitive psychology literature. Surely this must be because cognitive psychology tested the claims and failed to find an effect. In response to criticisms, Sharpley updated his earlier review with further evidence reporting that of 44 studies evaluating NLP, only six could be categorized as accepting the principles of NLP, PRS, eye movements, and predicate matching without criticism. Sharpley quantified the credibility gap further by pointing out that the majority of studies were not published in peer-reviewed journals but appeared to be abstracts from postgraduate theses. The ratio of non-supportive to supportive studies was 4.5 to 1, and sharply concluded, A, the PRS cannot be reliably assessed, B, when it is assessed, the PRS is inconsistent over time, therefore, C, it is not even certain that PRS exists, and D, Matching clients or other persons' PRS does not appear to assist counsellors reliably in any clearly demonstrated manner. The lack of a credible research base is not unknown by the NLP community. 
consider the following quote from the University of Surrey's NLP Research Project website. The academic research into NLP is thin. The empirical studies to date have various limitations. We review this research in a forthcoming journal article. We believe there is an urgent need for more research of a variety of methodological types. It is sometimes believed that the only valid research and the only type in which academics are interested is experimental and uses statistical methods to develop proofs. This is a narrow and somewhat stereotyped view of research. We support, in particular, qualitative and action-based methods, and we are strongly interested in the potential of NLP modelling as a phenomenological research method. In addition to pursuing our own research, nlpresearch.org seeks to support academic researchers and NLP practitioners wishing to inquire into NLP and its applications. Just a quick personal side note here. In other words, they don't like being held to the same standards as every other psychology modality that has to prove itself and prove its claims through research before it unleashes unknowns onto clients and messes with people. Phenomenological research is free from hypotheses, preconceptions and assumptions and seeks to describe rather than explain. Given the claims made by proponents of NLP, this adds little to the credibility debate and would produce reports concerning the experience from the perspective of the individual rather than confirmation of the claimed efficacy. The fact remains that NLP proponents make specific claims about how NLP works and what it can do, and this compels providing evidence to substantiate these claims. The above statement constitutes an admission that NLP does not have an evidence base and that NLP practitioners are seeking a post hoc credibility. In other words, they want to be exempt from scrutiny. They do not want to subject themselves to the same rigors as everyone else. Rules for thee, but not for me. Can NLP be thought of as an umbrella term? Criticisms of the primary ideas of NLP have more latterly been addressed with the argument that NLP has evolved to encompass the modelling of effective strategies in top performers and the adoption of strategies in others towards achieving a desired outcome. Kraft argues that NLP draws on the theoretical framework of social constructivism. Thus, it is considered to be experiential, action-based, and involving the negotiation of meaning, whatever any of that means. Tosi and Matheson, while concurring with Kraft that NLP is a set of strategies rather than a theory, suggested it was possible to infer a theoretical cohesion and that NLP should be described as reflecting a systematic theory, drawing its inspirations from the work of the cyberneticist Gregory Bateson. As such, NLP can be considered to be focused on feedback mechanisms. As Linda Peltz and Hall state, NLP is about adopting a humanistic, constructivist approach involving collaboration, focus on solutions, precision questioning, detachment from the problem, feedback, and finding out what works and what doesn't. However, such a description appears to categorize NLP as anything that ultimately helps an individual address a particular life issue. There exists in this an evaluative problem. An individual meets with an NLP practitioner regarding a particular issue. Strategies are tried until ultimately the individual feels a solution has been found. The practitioner thus claims another success story. Within this, however, it is impossible to quantify precisely what has happened owing to the humanistic constructivistic label. In this context, to describe NLP as social and or humanistic constructivism is nothing more than tautology and creates a smokescreen around the conclusion that its core ideas are unsupported. At the end of the day, none of this matters because NLP really works. Or does it? If NLP encourages people to learn ways of communicating more effectively, then that is a noble endeavor and not particularly problematic. However, the problem arises with the perpetuation of claims. 
It has been suggested that NLP is being applied widely, if often informally, in UK education. Such informal application makes it difficult to assess, but the claims of one NLP website are fairly typical, claiming that NLP can help you 1. Discover the children's preferred learning styles and allow for them to be different. 2. Use circle time to share their values and identity. 3. Celebrate their sunbeams and reframe their raindrops. 4. Allow children to share how they do things so that they can model each other. 5. Use brain gym to calm, energize, or reconnect right and left brain for improved concentration. 6. Help the children to access an appropriate state to learn easily. 7. Increase motivation by recognizing success and putting it in the future. Brain Gym, referred to in Claim 5, is a commercial learning efficiency program that appears to have been taken up by some schools despite a complete lack of evidence for its efficacy and is beyond the considerations of this paper. Of the remaining claims, 2, 3, and 7 are simply shallow statements with 1, 4, and 6 based on NLP's discredited claims about learning styles. In short, these claims are simply nonsense. In addition to the potential for informal application in education, NLP certified practitioners, quote unquote, make claims about its efficacy in the treatment of a whole range of quite serious disorders, such as addictions, eating disorders, anxiety problems, and pain management, to name but a few. Yet the medical literature is devoid of any published evidence to substantiate these claims. This creates a serious ethical problem in both the educational and the paramedical fields. As Heap points out, knowledge is power, and anybody making claims about being able to help with serious disorders or improve learning efficiency is making a claim for some kind of power. However, with that power, there must be accountability through public scrutiny. The lack of evidence for such claims means that the most rudimentary test of accountability cannot be addressed. In addition to this, if NLP is just a communication model, what special abilities does obtaining a certification in it bestow upon an individual which allows them to meddle in education issues and serious medical conditions? In relation to dealing with vulnerable, indeed perhaps desperate people, the claims of unqualified practitioners are extremely worrying. The precise nature of a quote-unquote qualification in NLP is difficult to ascertain, with many organizations offering impressive-sounding training from quote-unquote diplomas up to quote-unquote master practitioner. Precisely who accredits these qualifications, though? Who is responsible for externally examining and moderating them? How are they regulated? And how long do they take? The latter point is key with training courses in NLP being offered over a period of as little as two days. Consider the training required to become a chartered clinical psychologist. A British Psychological Society accredited first degree is needed, followed by three years of doctoral level training within the National Health Service. Such a system ensures that individuals are not only appropriately qualified, but are publicly accountable for their actions. Similar training is required to specialize in the other professional areas of psychology, with a minimum of six years training. An individual presenting themselves as being a master practitioner in NLP is giving the impression of having acquired a high level of training, yet it is an unregulated quote-unquote discipline. A code of conduct has been set out by the Association for Neurolinguistic Processing, yet worryingly it contains the following disclaimer. The code does not assume that individual members possess particular levels of skill in any specific area. It is important, therefore, that users of members' services do satisfy themselves that the person they are working with is appropriately skilled. To put the onus of responsibility onto the individual seeking the service is scandalous. What basis do they have to satisfy themselves that an individual is qualified in the face of impressive sounding claims and so-called qualifications? Personal testimonies are not difficult to come by in relation to the efficacy of NLP. A Google search will again yield a wealth of personal testimonies and endorsements of the powers of NLP. 
given that a similar search will equally yield personal testimony in favour of many other dubious techniques such as homeopathy, astrology or even trepanning, such testimonies are of little worth. Carl Sagan suggested a number of ways of detecting a fallacious argument, now known as Sagan's Baloney Detection Kit, the most pertinent being, wherever possible, there must be independent confirmation of the facts. Such independent confirmation of the claims of NLP does not exist. In conclusion, one could argue that to refute NLP is to engage in argumentum ad ignorantium, which is Latin for the argument from ignorance, and it's a fallacy in informal logic, which is an appeal to ignorance. In other words, a proposition is true because it has not yet been proven false, or conversely, a proposition is false because it has not yet been proven true. However, NLP singularly fails to stand up to scrutiny concerning its face validity and its construct validity. NLP's predictive validity is more difficult to ascertain as proponents of the discipline engage in academic goalpost shifting and arguments about its constructivist nature. Claims about what NLP can do persist though, and as such it is analogous to Bertrand Russell's celestial teapot, with the burden of proof to support its theoretical foundations and efficacy as an intervention lying with its proponents. The physicist Richard Feynman coined the term cargo cult science. In the South Seas, there is a cargo cult of people who, during wartime, observed lots of aeroplanes carrying goods. They wanted the planes to continue to land after the war, and so set about reconstructing airports with fires alongside the runway, a wooden hut for the air traffic controller to sit in, and antennas made out of bamboo. Despite the form of the airport being right, the planes didn't land. Feynman adapted this idiom of cargo cult science to refer to research that follows all the form and pretense of scientific investigation, yet is missing something essential. To adapt this term one more time, NLP masquerades as a legitimate form of psychotherapy, makes unsubstantiated claims about how humans think and behave, purports to encourage research in a vain attempt to gain credibility, yet fails to provide evidence that it actually works. Neurolinguistic programming is cargo cult psychology. You might be beginning to see some of the issues with the claims being made by people like my former bosses. If the best they can offer is something that pretends to be psychology without actually subjecting itself to the same standards of proper psychology, that's not a good start. And the fact that they also claim to have other qualifications which are unregulated and untested, such as recognized master practitioner in energy medicine and mindset work, or energy medicine practitioner. What exactly are those things? How do they work? Do they work? And is there any proof? Okay, so I've been editing this video for the better part of two weeks now and um, it's turning into a very long project so apologies for that but um, to make it a bit less lengthy I've decided to not really delve into Teal Swan so much because she probably deserves her own video on what she says and what she believes I don't think she's stupid and so I'm going to go through what she says and sort of compare it to psychology because she's not completely ignorant about what she's doing but that doesn't mean that it's good practice. But I thought that I would give you guys the benefit of having a look at my textbook on abnormal psychology and going through what the current research actually says about repressed and recovered memories. So in psychology and in psychology research and counseling practices, there's a thing known as dissociative amnesia, and it's under the category of dissociative disorders. So you will sometimes find dissociative amnesia in cases like um, dissociative identity disorder which used to be known as split personality 
So dissociative amnesia fits into that category in psychology. And the research that has been done on dissociation um, puts it into a sort of a similar area as PTSD. And dissociative disorders can be thought of as a form of complex PTSD. So they're trauma based. They are almost invariably uh, stemming from childhood trauma. So it's a very complicated um, area of research and treatment because uh, it can look like other things when it's presented to the health services. And so it's sometimes undiagnosed for a decade or more. People uh, suffer with these things for a very long time before they actually get the appropriate treatment. And having been through <laughs> um, trauma counselling myself, I can see how that happens. Um, I didn't experience any kind of dissociative um, responses, but after my separation in 2018, when I uh, left an abusive relationship, at first I went down the rabbit hole of the new age looking for healing and uh, meaning and truth. I am extremely invested in knowing what the truth is because I think that it matters. This isn't theoretical to me, this is personal. And when I eventually went to a doctor with uh, debilitating anxiety and was referred to counselling services, um, that was a huge turning point for me. But the counselling service that I first went to was not actually appropriate for trauma. And if I hadn't already done a lot of um, psychology study at that point, I might have been in a more vulnerable position and that counselling could have re-traumatised me because uh, I went to a regular counsellor for anxiety and sometimes those counsellors, they see a case of anxiety and they assume that the person is there because they have irrational fears and a trauma victim is not irrational and to treat someone with trauma as though they are being irrational is actually a form of gaslighting and it re-traumatizes people. So I ended up leaving that particular counsellor and seeking out proper trauma therapy through an organisation which uh, specialises in sexual assault. But I did this as an adult. I did this as a highly educated adult. And so people who are dealing with childhood trauma of that nature, uh, they are often underdiagnosed in many aspects. And part of that is because they don't want to talk about it. And so trauma informed therapy doesn't force them to talk about it before they're ready. So on page 220 of the textbook, and by the way, if you're looking for references, uh, I will leave a link in the description box to the blog and I will list all of my references there. But chapter eight is all about somatic symptom and dissociative disorders. So on page 220, it has uh, the debate about false memory and memory recovery. So this is the beginning. And then it goes over onto the next page and then it goes over the page. So I'll just read from this for you, but you can essentially take some screenshots. And this is the last page. So you can take screenshots of this if you want. A topic relevant to the dissociative disorders has been the focus of the most acrimonious, vicious and hurtful internal controversy in the history of modern psychiatry. The controversy goes by many names, including the memory debate and the recovered memory slash false memory debate. But the memory wars probably best conveys the level of hostility and conflict involved. 
There have now been dozens of books, hundreds of journals and magazine articles, and numerous websites of varying accuracy and balance devoted to the topic. In a nutshell, the controversy revolves around the fundamental issue of how traumatic experiences are remembered. Allegedly, there are two polarized views. One is that severely traumatic experiences such as childhood sexual abuse are often repressed or dissociated, and that when individuals subsequently recover these memories, they are always accurate. The opposite view is that trauma is always remembered, that it is impossible to forget, repress, or dissociate the memory, and that so-called recovered memories are actually false memories. Although these starkly opposing views are often presented in the popular media, it is probably the case that most in the mental health field are somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. What does the research say about this controversial topic? It should first be highlighted that empirical research may never be able to completely resolve this issue. This is for ethical rather than scientific reasons. That is, it is obviously impossible to conduct experimental research where children are subjected to horrendous acts of abuse in order to investigate how they remember it. Similarly, it is impossible to conduct studies that attempt to implant memories of horrific sexual and physical abuse, the kind reported by individuals with dissociative disorders. Instead, investigators need to rely on naturally occurring examples of trauma and memory as well as experimental studies on memory for non-traumatic events, which may not reflect memory processes for trauma. In support of the concept of dissociative amnesia and recovered memories are the numerous studies in which participants at least report having had amnesia for memories of trauma. For example, Brown, Shefflin and Whitfield reviewed the clinical research in this area and concluded that in just this past decade alone, 68 research studies have been conducted on naturally occurring dissociative or traumatic amnesia for childhood sexual abuse. Not a single one of the 68 database studies failed to find it. Researchers also note that recovered memories can be corroborated by sources other than the victim and seem to be no less accurate than continuous memories. They also point to experimental research on topics such as post-hypnotic amnesia, suggesting that laboratory analogues of amnesia do exist and that subsequent recovery of memories is possible. Supporters of the false memory position challenge the clinical data on dissociative amnesia and recovered memory, suggesting that perhaps the participants in the research simply forget rather than actively repress or dissociate from memories of trauma. False memory supporters also point to the accounts given by so-called retractors. That is, individuals who once claimed they were abused but have subsequently recanted and claimed that a therapist implanted the memory. Perhaps most importantly, the false memory supporters point to numerous types of experimental research on the creation of false memories. Such research led many professionals from various fields to conclude that it was easy to implant false childhood memories. However, several aspects of the false memory position are also open to criticism. First, it is difficult to know what to make of the retractors, given that it would be much easier to believe that a therapist had inflicted harm than to believe that a loved one had. Moreover, the recantations are themselves often rescinded. The experimental false memory research is limited, most notably by the fact that the implanted memories are typically for relatively common, plausible and non-traumatic experiences, such as getting lost in the shopping center. In contrast, Pezdek, Finger and Hodge investigated what happens when a suggestion of a more unusual and possibly traumatic memory analogous to sexual abuse, i.e. a rectal enema, was given. In their study, none of the participants adopted the suggestion. Research such as this addresses the limits of what memories can be implanted through suggestion. Most recently, Bruin and Andrews performed a systematic review of false memory research and took a balanced but critical stance. They pointed out that the term memory has often been used quite loosely in such research. Based on prominent views from autobiographical memory research, they pointed out that three factors need to exist for something to be considered a memory or a false memory. First, there needs to be a belief that the event was personally experienced by the person. 
Second, there needs to be some kind of imagery, usually visual, of the event. And third, there must be some degree of confidence that this imagery is a genuine memory of the original event. When the false memory research is viewed from this perspective, Bruin and Andrews reach the following conclusions. There are sufficient grounds to conclude that a probably small minority of people might develop false memories of childhood events with these characteristics and that any such memories might contain a mixture of true and false elements. On the other hand, we believe it cannot be concluded that false memories of childhood events possessing these characteristics are common, that they are easy to suggest or implant, or that the majority of individuals are susceptible to them. Beyond the scientific aspects of the debate, it seems undeniable that there are also social and political factors at work here. As described previously, amnesia for trauma was not a controversial topic in years past when it was associated with wartime trauma. Australian psychiatrist and researcher Sandy McFarlane, who is director of the University of Adelaide Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies, along with Bessel van der Kolk, highlighted this discrepancy when they concluded that it appears that as long as men were found to suffer from delayed recall of atrocities committed by a clearly identifiable enemy or by themselves, this issue was not controversial. However, when similar memory problems started to be documented in girls and women in the context of domestic abuse, the news was unbearable. When female victims started to seek justice against their alleged perpetrators, the issue moved from science into politics. Given the available evidence, how are psychologists supposed to respond in practice? The Australian Psychological Society has its own guidelines for psychological practice with clients with previously unreported traumatic memories, which state that psychologists always take seriously the client who refers to previously unreported traumatic memories. Psychologists accept that what the client tells them reflects their subjective reality and respect their reported experience. Psychologists avoid drawing premature conclusions about the accuracy of any previously unreported traumatic memory. And psychologists understand and assist their clients to tolerate uncertainty and ambiguity regarding the client's experience. The psychologist and client may both have to accept that the nature of past events cannot be known. The goals of therapy may include working towards acceptance of incomplete memories and treatment of current symptoms. The International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation also addressed this controversy in its treatment guidelines and provides some balanced advice for clinicians working in the area. Therapy does not benefit the clinicians automatically telling patients either that their memories are likely to be false or that they are accurate and must be believed. The therapist is not an investigator and there are ethical, boundary, and counter-transference considerations related to his or her role in attempting to prove or disprove the patient's trauma history. Moreover, therapists must be careful, whatever their theoretical persuasion, not to lose sight of the patient's vulnerability to accommodate in some way to the therapist's authority in the psychotherapy relationship the production of memories being one of them. A respectful, neutral stance on the therapist's part, combined with care to avoid suggestive and leading interview questions, along with ongoing discussion and education about the nature of memory, seems to allow patients the greatest freedom to evaluate the veracity and import of their memories. Finally, it is critical not to lose sight of the fact that child maltreatment is a very real problem some researchers have actually examined how the topic is covered in psychology textbooks versus how controversies such as this one regarding false and recovered memories are covered. For example, researchers reviewed several introductory psychology textbooks and abnormal psychology textbooks and found that many of them put greater emphasis on controversies than on the real scope and impact of the problem of child maltreatment. We have tried to avoid making the same mistake here. So as you can see, psychology takes this stuff very seriously and they want to do good research and they want to handle things in an appropriate way which helps the client rather than causing more damage.
but new age gurus don't have any training in this and they don't have any regulatory body that they answer to and they don't have any practical guidelines that they have to adhere to. So they can take one of these extremely polarizing positions and just run with it, even though the truth is somewhere in the middle. And that's why if you suspect that you have been the victim of childhood abuse, or if you know that you have traumatic experiences and traumatic memories, don't go to an unqualified practitioner. Instead, you need to seek out a specifically qualified trauma counselor because this is their field. This is what they do and they do care. So this begs the question, do the people who promote themselves as healers and gurus know that what they're saying is not based on research or based on good practices? Do they deliberately mislead people or have they got blind spots? And why are so many people willing to believe what they're saying? Why are so many people willing to pay them good money for services which possibly don't exist? Well, it turns out psychology has actually been looking into this very phenomenon. The first study was on self-regulation and people's ability to process information. And the abstract says, two experiments investigate the role of self-regulatory resources in BSing behavior. For example, communicating with little to no regard for evidence, established knowledge or truth, and receptivity and sensitivity to BS. It is hypothesized that evidence-based communication and BS detection require motivation and considerably greater self-regulatory resources relative to BSing and insensitivity to BS. In experiment one and experiment two, participants refrained from BSing only when they possessed adequate self-regulatory resources and were expected to be held accountable for their communicative contributions. Results of both experiments also suggest that people are more receptive to BS and less sensitive to detecting BS under conditions in which they possess relatively few self-regulatory resources. BSing involves intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously, communicating with little to no regard or concern for truth, genuine evidence, and or established semantic, logical, systemic, or empirical knowledge. As such, BSing is an insidious and common communicative behavior, often characterized by, but not limited to, using rhetorical strategies designed to disregard truth, evidence, and or established knowledge, such as exaggerating or embellishing one's knowledge, competence, or skills in a particular area or talking about things of which one knows nothing about in order to impress, fit in with, influence, or persuade others. Progress in the struggle against BS requires a deeper understanding of the conditions under which BS emerges. Although BS is likely to have numerous communicative functions, for example, impression management and social desirability, little empirical knowledge about BSing and its consequences can be found in the existing literature. Although commonly confused with lying, BSing is not the same as lying. Both the BSer and the liar appear to be genuinely concerned with the truth, but only the liar is actually concerned with truth. The liar knows the truth, but communicates with the goal of diverting others from the truth. The BSer has no regard for truth or evidence in support of what he or she claims. In fact, that which the BSer communicates may be true, but the BSer would not know it because the BSer does not care what the truth actually is and is not paying any attention to truth. To date, empirical examinations of BSing have emphasized its antecedents. Initial empirical examinations of BSing behavior conducted by Petrocelli showed that BSing emerges in at least five different contexts. First, people appear to engage in considerable BSing when social cues make them feel obligated to provide an opinion about something of which they know relatively little about. As Frankfurt noted, People often feel obligated to speak as though they possess informed opinions about everything, and people appear to be especially likely to engage in BSing 
when it is clear that the social expectations to have an opinion are relatively great. Second, people generally perceive themselves to engage in relatively less BSing behaviour as their knowledge of the discussion topic increases. Third, people appear to BS when they expect it to be relatively easy to pass BS. That is, people will engage in BSing when they anticipate ease in receiving a social pass of acceptance or tolerance for their communicative contributions. Fourth, consistent with Petrocelli's ease of passing BS hypothesis, BSing appears to be attenuated under conditions of social accountability. For instance, when people are expected to explain their reasoning for a position to another person, BSing can be attenuated. Finally, the effect of accountability on BSing is conditional upon the expected attitude of the audience. When the expected attitude of the audience is consistent with the speaker's attitude, speakers appear free to BS, but when the expected attitude of the audience is inconsistent with the speaker's attitude, speakers appear to attenuate their BSing. In other words, they BS less. Similar to BSing, very little is known about one's ability to detect BS. Frankfurt speculated that most people are not worried about BS because they think they can detect it and avoid its unwanted effects. Unfortunately, people are surprisingly bad at detecting BS. Initial empirical evidence concerning BS receptivity, for example, general acceptance of BS as something profound and or connected with truth, and BS sensitivity, i.e. the ability to differentiate and discern BS from information communicated with a concern for truth, suggests that BS is often undetected and misperceived as something profound and connected to truth. Such perceived profundity is especially likely among individuals employing more intuitive cognitive styles as opposed to more analytic or reflective cognitive styles. For instance, some people judge the profundity of assortments of words with absolutely no concern for or basis in truth to be relatively great, such as hidden meaning transforms unparalleled abstract beauty. BS can also have important social consequences and utilities, particularly BS is found to be evaluated less negatively than lying and can be used as a successful persuasion tactic. Like dual process models of attitudes and persuasion, impression formation and attributional inferences, stereotyping and prejudice, and other self-regulatory models incorporating dual processes, we argue that BSing and BS detection are additional behaviours influenced by dual processes. Indeed, the dual process model provides unique conceptualizations of the emergence of BSing behaviour and successful BS detection. Intuitive processing is efficient, running autonomously without requiring the expenditure of working memory capacity and self-regulatory resources. Systematic processing is deliberate, effortful and dependent upon working memory capacity and self-regulatory resources to be successfully executed. When systematic processing was disrupted in our experiments by taxing executive abilities, we observed greater amounts of BS. We can only conclude that BSing behavior operates as an intuitive process, whereas evidence-based communication operates as a systematic process, as both self-perceived and socially perceived BSing was found under conditions in which executive functioning abilities were relatively constrained. Likewise, our data suggests that BS detection also requires relatively great executive abilities and self-regulatory resources to be executed successfully, making it a relatively analytic and systematic process. Such conclusions have very practical prescriptions for future behavior to the extent that BSing is unlikely to be viewed as a particularly positive or admired behavior and to the extent that people wish to avoid the unwanted effects of BS. Specifically, one may choose to refrain from talking about things of which they know little to nothing about under any conditions that would be expected to attenuate self-regulatory resources. For example, contributing to an important discussion when feeling fatigued or unmotivated to process shared content accurately. Likewise, to the extent that one desires to be unaffected by BS, 
one may again choose to refrain from processing information under any conditions that would be expected to attenuate self-regulatory resources, e.g. surfing the internet when feeling fatigued or unmotivated to process shared content accurately. In other words, thinking is hard, and it demands a lot of mental resources, especially when you're bombarded with a whole bunch of information and buzzwords that you don't really know how to interpret. The advice from this article is to spend time actually assessing the information that you're given in the new age, rather than just accepting it at face value. But of course, this requires a lot of effort. The new age is constantly telling people to shut down critical thinking. They say that it's not enlightened enough, and they're always telling people to tune into their intuition and only follow their intuition rather than actually critically analysing the information that they're given. This can make people vulnerable to shady gurus who don't have good intentions and who are just exploiting them for financial gain. The next research paper, entitled You Can't BS a BSer, or Can You?, stated that research into both receptivity to falling for BS and the propensity to produce it have recently emerged as active independent areas of inquiry into the spread of misleading information. However, it remains unclear whether those who frequently produce BS are inoculated from its influence. For example, both BS receptivity and BSing frequency are negatively related to cognitive ability and aspects of analytical thinking style, suggesting that those who frequently engage in BSing may be more likely to fall for BS. However, separate research suggests that individuals who frequently engage in deception are better at detecting it, thus leading to the possibility that frequent BSs may be less likely to fall for BS. Here we present three studies attempting to distinguish between these competing hypotheses, finding that frequency of persuasive BSing, in other words, BSing intended to impress or persuade others, positively predicts susceptibility to various types of misleading information, and that this association is robust to individual differences in cognitive ability and analytical cognitive style. Assessing the cognitive mechanisms underlying the transmission and detection of misleading information is critical for understanding the persuasive allure of such messages and their power to influence beliefs and behaviour. Indeed, such questions have spurred recent research to examine potential mechanisms underlying the transmission and reception of BS, Finding some cognitive similarities between those who transmit BS, i.e. BSs, and those who are more receptive to its allure. Common wisdom suggests that people who frequently mislead others are less likely to be misled themselves, a notion often expressed as, you can't BS a BSer. This idea finds at least some support in past research, showing that people who self-report engaging more frequently in lying, in other words, deliberately convincing someone of a falsehood, also self-report being significantly better than average at detecting lies from others. Additionally, some studies have found that those who produce more convincing lies are also actually better at detecting lies, though other more recent studies suggest this may not be the case. And others have pointed out, even though BSing is misleading by its very nature, it is distinct from outright deception in that it falls just short of lying. Indeed, recent research has suggested that BSing and lying while clearly related, are psychologically distinguishable constructs. For example, liars show a stronger negative association with self-regard and a stronger positive association with lie acceptability than BSs. Additionally, persuasive BSing, in other words, BSing motivated by a desire to impress or persuade others, has been found to be significantly negatively related to cognitive ability, while the same has not been found for lying. Given these findings, BSs may differ from liars in other meaningful ways, such as their ability to detect the same types of misleading communication that they frequently engage in. Implicit within the observations presented here are the somewhat complex interpersonal dynamics involved in how BS is produced, transmitted, and received. As Frankfurt and others have defined it, BSing is intentional, deliberate, and strategic, For example, a person can massage truthful information in a way that would be, by definition, BSing, 
if he is doing so to be misleading or misrepresent his own goals. However, if a BSer transmits information in an earnest attempt to convey a true message, yet is unaware the information he is transmitting is actually BS, he is not, by definition, engaging in BSing, because there was no intention to mislead or misrepresent by statement or implicature. Consequently, just as a liar might unknowingly spread lies because he believes them to be true, he cannot unintentionally engage in lying. Likewise, a BSer might unknowingly spread BS because he believes it to be true, but cannot unintentionally engage in BSing. This has important implications regarding the extent to which BSers are able to recognize and possibly prevent those times when they are unknowingly spreading BS. Given the intentional strategic nature of BSing, if a BSer unintentionally or unknowingly spreads BS at a strategically disadvantageous time, because he or she is unable to detect it, it may nullify both the perceived and actual utility of BSing as a rhetorical persuasion strategy for that person in general. We attempted to address this issue in the present study, at least in part, by testing the BS insensitivity abilities of two types of self-reported prolific BSs, with empirical measures of various types of BS receptivity. One limitation, though, is that we did not ask participants to assess their own BS detection abilities, as previous deception research has done. Indeed, given that higher frequency persuasive BSs were, somewhat ironically, consistently found to be more receptive to various types of BS and were simultaneously overconfident in their own intellectual abilities, it could very well be the case that they are largely unaware of their own inability to sufficiently detect when they are being misled. That is, higher frequency persuasive BSs may experience unique Dunning-Kruger-like effects related to their own perceived and actual ability to detect misleading information. Put another way, they may have a BS blind spot, akin to that found in other domains. Therefore, it would be informative for future BSing research to investigate the extent to which the self-assessed and empirically measured BS detection abilities of persuasive BSs align, as well as how BS-specific overconfidence might be related to other analytic and metacognitive processes that play important roles in the transmission and detection of various types of misleading information. In conclusion, gaining a better understanding of the differing ways in which various types of misleading information are transmitted and received is becoming increasingly important in the information age. Indeed, an oft-repeated maxim in popular culture is you can't BS a BSer. While folk wisdom may assert that this is true, while folk wisdom may assert that this is true, the present investigation suggests that the reality is a bit more complicated. Our primary aim was to examine the extent to which BSing frequency is associated with susceptibility to falling for BS. Overall, we found that persuasive BSs, but not evasive BSs, were more receptive to various types of BS, and in the case of pseudo-profound statements, even when controlling for factors related to intelligence and analytic thinking. These results enrich our understanding of the transmission and detection of certain types of misleading information, specifically the associations between the propensity to produce and the tendency to fall for BS, and will help to inform future research in this growing area of scholarship. In other words, New Age gurus tend to believe their own hype, and they also tend to believe the hype of other New Age gurus, and it goes round and round and round in circles, them sharing each other's crap. The mindset behind believing BS was further explored in a paper entitled Inquisitive but Not Discerning. It says, Epistemic curiosity, the desire for knowledge, is typically thought to benefit learning, in four pre-registered studies, we show that interest curiosity, a facet of epistemic curiosity characterized by joyful exploration, is indeed associated with traits and abilities that benefit learning. These include general knowledge, intellectual humility, and discernment of the quality of information. In contrast, deprivation curiosity, a facet motivated by uncertainty reduction, is associated with errors and confusion. Individuals high in deprivation curiosity claim familiarity with new information and made-up concepts. 
They find meaning in BS, believe disinformation, and lack intellectual humility. We theorize that deprivation curiosity is characterized by an indiscriminate openness to information. Epistemic curiosity, or the desire for knowledge, is widely considered an important virtue and a driving force behind learning and innovation. Thus far, the literature has primarily focused on the beneficial aspects of curiosity. Might there be a dark side to it? Could our thirst for knowledge open our mind not only to true and meaningful information, but also to meaningless nonsense, falsehoods, and disinformation? In the present set of studies, we approach this question by taking a closer look at the facets that make up epistemic curiosity and examining how they relate to processes directly relevant to acquiring knowledge, the results reveal an intellectually beneficial facet and a darker, disadvantageous side. Observing that the desire for knowledge can be motivated by different emotions and motivations, researchers identified two facets of epistemic curiosity, interest and deprivation curiosity. Interest curiosity is motivated by the joy of exploration. It describes an intrinsic motivation for learning new things and diving deep into complex and unfamiliar topics. It is unspecific in that the primary motivation is exploring and learning new things rather than pursuing a particular topic. Deprivation curiosity is more specific and more emotionally ambivalent. It is motivated by the desire to reduce the unpleasant itch of uncertainty and frustration that arises when we are presented with an unanswered question. Although interest and deprivation curiosity can be thought of as motivational states, there are trait-like individual differences in how often people experience these states. At the trait level, interest and deprivation curiosity are correlated. Nonetheless, they are distinct constructs. Deprivation curiosity is associated with higher levels of negative emotions and trait level anxiety, anger, and depression, whereas interest curiosity is not. Interest curiosity is associated with high tolerance for ambiguity and low need for closure, whereas deprivation curiosity is not. Interest curiosity has been linked to mastery-oriented learning goals, whereas deprivation curiosity has been linked to more performance-oriented goals. Deprivation curiosity has also been shown to correlate with the dark triad, a well-studied cluster of socially aversive personality traits, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and subclinical psychopathy, whereas interest curiosity has exclusively been linked to desirable traits, or pro-social traits. Despite these differences in the motivations, emotions, and personality traits associated with interest and deprivation curiosity, surprisingly little is known about differences between the two pertaining to learning. This is especially surprising since interest and deprivation curiosity are defined by the desire for knowledge. While studies on epistemic curiosity have documented various benefits for learning, they have typically not looked at the independent effects of interest and deprivation curiosity. To our knowledge, the current research is the first to show that interest and deprivation curiosity relate differently to a number of epistemic processes, that is, processes related to acquiring knowledge. So let's have a look at curiosity and epistemic processes. Satisfying the thirst for knowledge is not as simple as quenching our literal thirst. To acquire knowledge, one needs to be discerning of the quality of information. One needs to be attentive to new versus old information and evaluate critically which information is true and meaningful and which is nonsensical, false or misleading. And one needs to be aware of the limits of one's existing knowledge. To understand how interest and deprivation curiosity relate to these epistemic processes, the current research examined a number of measures outlined next. Since curious people have a desire for knowledge, one would expect that they have a rich body of knowledge. There is indeed indirect evidence linking curiosity, in this case inferred from openness to experience, to general knowledge. Openness to experience, by the way, is a personality trait. But being knowledgeable is no antidote to making false claims of knowledge. Evidence for this comes from the overclaiming procedure. This procedure resembles a standard general knowledge test, which also contains made up terms. Thus, it measures both real knowledge and overclaiming or the tendency to make false claims of knowledge. 
Because distinguishing real from false information seems obviously important for acquiring knowledge, one might expect that curious individuals are good at distinguishing real and made-up concepts. However, there is reason to expect curiosity could also make people prone to overclaiming. Here it is important to understand why people overclaim. While overclaiming was initially interpreted as a sign of self-enhancement, it can also stem from confusion. Highly knowledgeable individuals and those high in openness to experience are prone to overclaiming. Dunlop AL speculated that this was due to their inquisitive nature, which causes them to generate vivid associations between the words that describe made up concepts and real concepts in their memory. The activation and retrieval of memories can create the illusion of familiarity. It feels as if the made up concept was retrieved from memory when it was merely semantically associated with real memories. Given this link between inquisitiveness and confusion in the overclaiming procedure, we wanted to examine if interest and deprivation curiosity relate to the ability to distinguish between real and made up concepts. BS is a special category of information. It is neither true nor false, but it lacks coherent meaning. Consider this example. We are being called to explore the totality itself as an interface between serenity and intuition. Some people find meaning in this type of nonsense. BS receptivity has been linked to conspiracy beliefs and political ideology. So far, nobody has looked at how curiosity relates to it. Since curious individuals are eager to acquire knowledge, one might expect them to be critical of meaningless nonsense. On the other hand, their appetite for information may make them open to all kinds of information, perhaps even BS. Epistemic curiosity is generally thought to be an important motivator for learning, but here we reveal a surprising dark side to one of the two facets, deprivation curiosity. Despite their conceptual differences, both types of curiosity are defined by the desire for knowledge, so it would seem reasonable that both should drive learning and knowledge gain. To our surprise, we found evidence that only interest curiosity is associated with a rich general knowledge base. On the trivia task, for instance, greater interest curiosity was associated with more correct answers, whereas greater deprivation curiosity predicted less knowledge. The overclaiming task also can be thought of as a general knowledge test. We found that interest curiosity was consistently associated with more hits, mostly in the absence of inflated false alarms. This again indicates greater general knowledge. In contrast, deprivation curiosity mostly did not predict hits, and in one study was even associated with fewer hits. In addition to a decreased knowledge base, deprivation curiosity was associated with notable errors of discernment. Participants high in deprivation curiosity claimed familiarity with new information in the memory task and were bad at distinguishing real from made up concepts in the overclaiming task. They further showed a tendency to find meaning in nonsense and a willingness to entertain and share blatantly false news. We ruled out the possibility that these deficits are explained by a lack of analytical thinking. Past research linked receptivity to fake news and BS to decreased analytical thinking. We replicated this finding, but found no relationship between analytical thinking and deprivation curiosity. Ironically, high deprivation curious individuals are not only burdened with a decreased knowledge base and errors in discernment, our results suggest they are also less likely to realize when they are wrong, as evidenced by a lack of intellectual humility. Although the evidence for this was less strong in study two, the general pattern that interest and deprivation relate differently to intellectual humility was robust, being observed across all four studies. The differences were more pronounced for the comprehensive intellectual humility scale, which is longer and has a stronger emphasis on the interpersonal aspects of intellectual humility. How can we reconcile what appears to be a paradoxical phenomenon in relation to those evidencing deprivation curiosity? A promiscuous desire for information, but also a lack of humility or openness to revising their beliefs in light of new evidence. Deprivation curiosity seems to be characterized by a pattern of cognitive seizing and freezing, 
a terminology originally introduced in the context of the need for closure, but offered here as a broader metaphor to describe alternative ways of engaging with information. When new information is available, people may either embrace it, seize, or resist updating their current knowledge, freeze. When we are exposed to unfamiliar topics, being open to new information helps reduce the void in our current state of understanding. However, when we have prior beliefs or knowledge of particular topics, we may be motivated to resist challenges to our knowledge to avoid aversive states of uncertainty. The promiscuous desire for information in individuals with high deprivation curiosity seems to express itself both in pronounced seizing as well as freezing. Highly deprivation curious individuals are overly receptive to new information, even BS and disinformation, but they are resistant to questioning their existing beliefs. In other words, they very readily accept anything which fits in with their current belief system, even if it's total BS, but they immediately reject anything which does not fit in with their current belief system, even if it's actually true and it disproves the things that they previously believed. The lack of intellectual humility and the complete disregard for truth, which is part of BS, as long as it placates the emotions in the moment, is consistent with narcissistic patterns of thinking and behavior, as noted in this study when they found dark triad personality traits. In other words, the truth doesn't matter as long as I feel good in the immediate present moment. BS sensitivity predicts prosocial behavior. It says, BS sensitivity is the ability to distinguish pseudo-profound BS sentences, such as, your movement transforms universal observations, from genuinely profound sentences. For example, the person who never made a mistake never tried something new. Although BS sensitivity has been linked to other individual difference measures, it has not yet been shown to predict any actual behavior. We therefore conducted a survey study with over a thousand participants from a general sample of the Swedish population and assessed participants' BS receptivity, i.e. their perceived meaningfulness of seven BS sentences, which you can see over on the right in table one, and profoundness receptivity, their perceived meaningfulness of seven genuinely profound sentences, also found in table one, and use these variables to predict two types of prosocial behavior, self-reported donations, and a decision to volunteer for charity. Despite BS receptivity and profoundness receptivity being positively correlated with each other, logistic regression analyses showed that profoundness receptivity had a positive association, whereas BS receptivity had a negative association with both types of prosocial behavior. These relations held up for the most part when controlling for potentially intermediating factors, such as cognitive ability, time spent completing the survey, sex, age, level of education, and religiosity. The results suggest that people who are better at distinguishing the pseudo-profound from the actually profound are more pro-social. This study is the first to demonstrate that individual differences in how people react to pseudo-profound BS statements and to actually profound statements predict their behavior. People with high BS receptivity, in other words, those who find pseudo-profound BS statements such as the unexplainable touches on the inherent experiences of the universe to be highly meaningful, were overall less likely to engage in prosocial behavior than people with low BS receptivity. Conversely, people with high profoundness receptivity in other words, those who think that actually profound statements such as your teacher can open the door, but you have to step in are highly meaningful, were overall more likely to engage in prosocial behavior than those with low profoundness receptivity. This pattern emerged both when prosocial behavior was assessed in terms of participants' self-reported donation experience, whether or not they have donated to charity in the past year, and even clearer when it was measured in terms of participants' likelihood to volunteer in order to raise money for charity. For the most part, it also held up well when controlling for potential intermediating factors such as cognitive ability, education, religiosity, 
age and time spent completing the survey. In addition to this, the fact that we had over a thousand participants from a roughly nationally representative Swedish sample gives us further reason to think that the obtained relations between BS and profoundness receptivity and prosocial behaviour are robust and generalizable. Just a side note on how psychology studies work, generalizability is usually dependent on the sample size. So the larger the size of the sample of people, so a thousand people compared to 10 people, the more you can generalize the results to the broader population, the more it should apply to most people. That's why case studies are not considered to be good science, because they only have a sample of one participant. The take home message of this article is that although BS receptivity and profoundness receptivity were positively correlated with each other, they yet correlated in opposite directions with prosocial behavior, which suggests that it is primarily individual differences in BS sensitivity, the ability to distinguish the pseudo profound from the actually profound, and not individual differences in the propensity to perceive any given sentence as meaningful that positively predict prosocial behavior. The obtained results support Penny Cook's assertion that individual differences in how people react and respond to BS is a relevant and important construct that tells us something about a person over and above their cognitive ability. However, the results also show that future research on the psychology of BS needs to consider not just people's receptivity to BS per se, but that it should situate BS receptivity in the context of people's ability to distinguish BS from the actually profound. In addition to our main findings, the current study tested whether results from previous research, exclusively studying mechanical Turk users or US undergraduate students, held up if tested on a heterogeneous and non-American sample. Generally, in line with the findings of Pennycook, we found that religiosity correlated positively with a tendency to perceive meaningfulness in BS sentences. Just a side note on this study, they don't actually clarify what they mean by religiosity, so it's not really ascertained what religiosity it's referring to, just religiosity in general. Also consistent with previous studies, cognitive ability correlated negatively with BS receptivity, but positively with profoundness receptivity. Participants' age and level of education also correlated negatively with BS receptivity, but positively with profoundness receptivity, even when controlling for the shared variance. However, unlike previous research conducted in the US, we did not find any strong and consistent relation between reactions to BS and political self-placement on the left to right scale in the Swedish context. I think in the American sample, it's probably more related to Trump specifically, rather than actually left or right leaning political views. It's a strange phenomenon how much people simply accept whatever Trump says. And I'm not particularly averse to some of the things that Trump says, but I don't particularly implicitly trust everything that comes out of his mouth because after all, he is a billionaire politician. So pretty much everything he says needs to be taken with a grain of salt. So what is the link between BS receptivity, pseudo profound word salad and new age spirituality? Well, I'm glad you asked. In a research article titled Reception and Willingness to Share Pseudo-Profound BS and Their Relation to Other Epistemically Suspect Beliefs and Cognitive Ability, it says propensity to judge randomly generated, syntactically correct, i.e. BS, statements as profound is associated with a variety of conceptually relevant variables, e.g. intuitive cognitive style and supernatural beliefs. Besides generalizing these findings to a different cultural setting, we examine the relationships to sharing the BS on social media. Rating nonsense as profound was associated with a lower cognitive ability, a stronger belief in the paranormal, alternative medicine and conspiracies, and ontological confusion. The more profound a statement was rated to be, the more likely it was to be shared, and propensity for sharing BS was predicted by ontological confusion and religious beliefs. 
BS receptivity and sharing may be closely related to several dimensions of epistemically suspect beliefs. People with these propensities are relatively open to vague statements resembling New Age spirituality. BS, defined as either useless talk, nonsense, or as statements produced without concern for the truth, has long been a topic of interest among linguists and philosophers, yet it has only recently attracted the attention of psychologists. One of the defining features of pseudo-profound BS, according to researchers, is that it attempts to impress rather than to inform, to be engaging rather than instructive. It uses buzzwords and deliberate vagueness to mask the lack of meaning. Vagueness is deliberately used to obscure the meaning of the statement and hence convey the impression of deep meaning, i.e. profundity. What is considered profound or deeply meaningful may differ across individuals. Pennycook Aeol had participants judge the profundity of randomly generated statements, thus ensuring that there was no intended meaning. In this way, these truly nonsensical but syntactically correct sentences can be viewed as instances of BS according to Frankfurt's definition, that is, statements where there is no concern for the truth, merely an aim to impress through the use of New Age buzzwords. Importantly, Pennycook Aeol found that the propensity to judge these statements as profound was associated with a variety of conceptually relevant variables, e.g. intuitive cognitive style and supernatural beliefs. They were also associated with a preference for conservative presidential candidates in the US elections, and for a free market economy. In a more recent study, Pennycook and Rand examined willingness to share fake news in conjunction with BS reception, and they found that higher BS receptivity was positively related to a greater willingness to share fake news. Fake news in this study is defined as pretty much clickbait, which pretty much almost all forms of media engage in, um, even mainstream media. The conclusion of the Eastern European study was quite interesting. It says, in this paper we examined whether BS receptivity was related to belief in other epistemically suspect beliefs, such as paranormal beliefs, conspiracy theories, and complementary and alternative medicine, and lower cognitive abilities, using a sample from two Eastern European countries. Moreover, we examined whether this relationship was more pronounced in BS sharing. The results indicated that the new measure we used, BS sharing on social media, correlated with profundity ratings of BS. Generally, we found that the more profound a given statement was rated to be, regardless of whether it was BS, a motivational quote, or a mundane statement, the more likely it was to be shared. Moreover, we found that propensity for sharing BS was predicted by ontological confusion and religious beliefs. In other words, the more literally people understood metaphorical statements, and the more religious they were, the more prone they were to sharing not only BS, but also various motivational and mundane statements on social media. Our results imply that people who judge a wider spectrum of statements as profound tend to be more willing to share indiscriminate content on social media, and thus unknowingly spread BS further. This suggests that the best way to stop the spread of nonsense on social media and in our daily lives is to improve both people's ability to inhibit the first thought that comes into their mind, cognitive reflection, and the cognitive capacity to think more about the items we encounter. However, because not all people are willing or able to spend more time contemplating the content they choose to share on social media, practical interventions should focus on cueing analytical thinking and highlighting the consequences of spreading untruthful and often harmful information. So what were those two particular items that they found which predicted online sharing. That was ontological confusion and religiosity. And in the study, it actually outlines how they measured them. So the ontological confusion scale comprises 31 statements containing mentalizing matter. For example, old furniture knows things about the past. Physicalizing mental, e.g. an unstable human mind is disintegrating or biologizing mental, e.g. an evil thought is contaminated. For comparison, there were four entirely metaphorical statements. 
e.g. a wailing wind is a flute, and for true statements, running water is fluid. The participants rated the items on a scale ranging from 1, only metaphorically true, to 5, only literally true. A higher score overall indicates a higher level of ontological confusion, that is, mistakenly attributing a literal meaning to metaphorical statements. The Santa Clara Strength of Religious Faith Questionnaire is a short 10-item self-report measure assessing the strength of religious faith and engagement. It does not relate to a specific religion. Participants indicate their agreement with statements such as, I pray daily, on a scale ranging from 1, strongly disagree, to 4, strongly agree. Thus, a higher score indicated stronger religious faith. One of the reasons why I wanted to go deeper into this side is, first of all, the word ontology is not commonly used and it can be a bit confusing as to what they mean by that. So it was good to get some clarification. But the other reason why I wanted to look at religiosity is because it's not absolutely certain that people who have New Age beliefs are identifying as New Age practitioners. There are a lot of people in churches who hold a great deal of New Age beliefs without realizing that those beliefs are not Christian. Being in church doesn't mean that people are exempt or inoculated necessarily from taking on very strange belief systems. So now that we've gone through all of the research, what would I say is the takeaway that I've learned from my previous involvement in the New Age? I think, like most people, I went there looking for answers to all the things that seemed wrong with my life and wrong with the world around me. The New Age claimed to have answers. They claim to speak truth and provide meaning, but their promises are empty and their profundity is hollow. As it says in the letter of Jude, they are clouds without water, carried by every passing wind. Walking according to their own desires, they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. They claim to vibrate love, non-judgment, and acceptance, but their definition of love is shallow and self-serving, and acceptance is a cunning way of saying, tolerate my BS without question, otherwise I'll label you as offensive, or perhaps low vibration. It's a way of discrediting and dismissing legitimate critiques and is, ironically, very judgmental. A big problem is how invested they are in their own delusions. They really believe the BS they create and they protect their fantasy construct by rejecting scrutiny of their assertions and anyone with the audacity to speak the truth. Rational thought is a new age sin and feeling like something is true for you is completely valid even if your feelings bear no resemblance to reality whatsoever. Rather than adopt a humble mindset where they consider the possibility that not everything they believe is true or beneficial for them, instead they attach their self-worth to all the quote-unquote spirituality junk that they've been hoarding. They're constantly chasing the next level because they're chasing a mirage. They won't find what they really need in pseudo-spiritual buzzwords about transcendence, awakenings, higher dimensions, ascended masters, or cosmic vibrations. One of the biggest problems I found when trying to discern whether the New Age offered anything authentic was that I basically had to get a degree in psychology to understand how full of crap they actually are. I'm hoping that content like this will help you to figure it out for yourself. I believe that information should be accessible so people can be empowered to make informed choices and protect themselves from predatory behavior. Blind faith isn't really faith. It's just blindness. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share it with people who you believe will benefit. Thanks for watching again.